Good day, grade tens. Welcome to this next lesson in physical science. In this lesson, we're going to carry on talking about waves, but we're going to learn about longitudinal waves. Now, if you remember, we spoke about, um, I just want to, before we carry on with longitudinal waves, I want to remind you about transverse waves. So what do we remember about transverse waves we've learned? We've learned that the transverse waves are your water waves. In fact, everything except sound is a transverse wave. Okay. And what is special about the transverse wave is that although the motion of the wave might be from left to right, the particle moves up and down. So the particle is going to move up and the particle is going to move down, although the motion of the wave is causing the particle to move forward at the same time. So therefore we say that the motion of the particle is 90 degrees or perpendicular to the direction of the wave. So that is a transverse wave. Okay, remember that? Transverse wave. Now, and remember this was a crest, and this was a trough. This bit here was an amplitude. Okay. The whole of this is one wavelength, because there would be two points that are in phase. Okay, the closest two points, the, the two adjacent points in phase is going to be the distance between one wavelength. And the time taken for one wavelength to pass the point is the period. Okay, so that is the transverse wave. Now we're going to talk about the longitudinal wave. So the definition of the longitudinal wave says a longitudinal wave is a wave where the particles in the medium move parallel to the direction of propagation of the wave. So remember, transverse, they moved up and down while the wave moved from left to right so that they they ended up doing this, right? Now you've got a longitudinal wave. This is where the particles in the medium move parallel. Okay, so if we had to play this for you, which I'm intending to do, okay, if I can just get the little arrow to, here we go. Where's it gone? Where's it gone? <laughs> Hang on a second. Um, I just need to get this thing to play. So there we go. So you can see that in the longitudinal wave, the direction of the wave and the direction of the particles are all in the same direction. Whereas the transverse wave, the particles move up and down, even though the motion of the wave is in 90 degrees to it. Okay, let's just watch that again. Um, okay, so longitudinal wave, Everything is parallel. The particles are moving parallel to the motion of the wave. There's a bit of reflect reflection happening over there. Whereas a transverse wave, the actual particles are moving. Yes, carry on. Are moving perpendicular to the direction of the wave. The wave is actually moving. Can you see it? It's actually moving in the horizontal direction, but the wave is moving perpendicular. Okay, so again, what is happening is the wave is moving in this direction from left to right, okay? So what is happening is that you'll see, and you did see that there were areas where the waves were compressed and areas where they weren't. Okay, let's just go back quickly and I'll just show you that. So if we go back, okay, so you can watch. There is a compression, there is the compression, okay? And the bits between the compression bits between the compression are called rarefactions. I know it's a very horrible word to try and remember, but rarefactions, I kind of like it. So compressions is a region in the longitudinal wave where the particles are closest together, and rarefactions is a region in the longitudinal wave where the particles are furthest apart, obviously. Okay, it makes sense. You need to know these definitions. Okay, now, a wavelength, and I'm going to talk about that in the... Next slide, yeah. A wavelength is basically, remember, is a distance between two consecutive points that are in phase, as always, okay? But now, so in other words, you could take it from the middle of a rarefaction to the middle of a rarefaction, or you could take it from the end of a compression to the end of a compression, or you could take it from the beginning of a compression to the beginning, or you could take it from the middle of a compression to the middle of a compression. But obviously finding the exact middle of a compression 
okay, is quite hard to do. And I mean, of a rarefaction. And similarly, finding the exact part that's in the middle of a compression is quite hard to do when we look talking about a real life wave, not one that we've drawn. So therefore, the wavelengths are usually designated as from the beginning of a compression to the beginning of a compression or the end of a compression to the end of a compression. Okay, so the wavelength and longitudinal wave refers to the distance between two consecutive compressions or two consecutive rarefactions. Okay, amplitude. Now remember that when we were talking about transverse wave, it is very easy because this was the amplitude, right? And it was the maximum displacement from equilibrium or from the air, from the line of zero disturbance, right? That's basically what we said. Okay, so in other words, if there's no wave, then this is where the water would lie. Now there's suddenly a wave. So therefore this amplitude is the maximum distance from that zero line. Okay, now it says for a longitudinal wave, which is a pressure wave, this would be the maximum increase or decrease in pressure from the equilibrium pressure that is uh, that is caused when a compression or a reaction passes a point. Okay, let's read that again. For a longitudinal wave, which is a pressure wave, this would be the maximum increase or decrease in pressure from the equilibrium pressure that is caused when a compression or rarefaction passes a point. So in other words, if we're sitting here and we have a normal amount of pressure and suddenly, okay, let's go back to this. Okay, so if we watch this, okay, I need to get my pen. I mean my arrow. No way to go, way to go, way to go, way to go. There it is. Why is it not? Okay, hang on, there we go. If you, okay, now just pause for a second. That is the do you see that this bit here is in its normal state? Okay, so that's in its point of equilibrium. That bit there is a compression that's going to come through, okay? The difference between that compression and the point of the zero disturbance here is called the amplitude, okay? Does that help? Okay, right, so now let's carry on. Okay, the period of a wave is the time taken by the wave to move one wavelength, nothing changes. And the frequency of a wave is the number of wavelengths per second. Again, nothing changes. Okay, cool. So we've got the wave equation where V is equal to lambda F again. Okay, and I need to get my little pen out again. Let's see if I've got it. No, I haven't. <sighs> Sorry. Okay, so we've got V is the speed of the wave, right? Speed of the wave, and that is in meters per second. Lambda is the wavelength, and that is in meters. And frequency, remember, is in hertz. Okay, this is, F is the frequency. Sorry, I've done the wrong way around. Let me write this. Frequency, and it's measured in hertz. Okay, so velocity equals lambda times frequency, and remember that is the wave equation that is on your formula sheet, grade tens. Okay, we also know that period is one over frequency, and frequency is equal to one over period, and obviously speed equals distance over time, okay, which we may need as well. Okay, so let's do an example. This is a tip typical exam question, okay? In fact, this came out of a grade 10 example paper, so let's go through it. It says, you've got a slinky movement, which is what we've been looking at already. This is the direction of wave propagation, so it's moving in that direction. Okay, it hasn't reflected yet, because note that that's a wall. Okay, and it says, and name the type of wave produced in the slinky. Well, it's obviously the longitudinal wave, longitudinal. And it says your naming must be based on the movement of the sink in the direction of propagation of the wave. Done that. Now it says this point X and Y are, represent regions in the quill where the quills are spread out, spread apart. Okay. Thus, maximum is in the distance. What is the name given to such points? Well, these are called rare factions. Rare fractions. And please note, grade 10 is not rare fractions, it's rare fractions. There's no R there, okay? Then it says point O, 
point P and point Q represent regions where the coils are pressed together a small amount of space. What is the name given to such points? And again, this is called compressions. Compressions. So it's determine the wavelength of the wave in meters from the sketch. Okay. So we know the wavelength is the distance between two points in phase or between two compressions, two consecutive compressions. So in other words, a wavelength would be from O to P or from P to Q or even from X to Y. So we know the full distance from O to Q is 45. So O to Q is 45 centimeters. Okay, O to Q is 45 centimeters. Okay, O to P would actually be one wavelength. This is actually two times the wavelength. Okay, so one one wavelength, one wavelength equals O P, which is going to be half of 45 centimeters, which is going to be 22,5 centimeters. But now grade tens. Actually, they told us, it says determine the wavelength of the wave in meters. Even if they hadn't said it, you should always give your wavelength in its SI unit, okay? And its SI unit is meters. So how do you get from centimeters to meters? Well, you have to divide by 100, okay? Centimeters, I was just thinking about whether I said it correctly, centimeters to meters. To get from centimeters to meters, you need to divide by 100. There are 100 centimeters in a meter, so we need to divide by 100. So we're going to go 22,5 is going to be what? It's going to be 0,225 meters. But remember, this is science. And since it is science, what do we know? We know that we need to round off to two decimal places, which means that that is going to be 0, 0,23 meters. Meters. Okay, excellent. Now, the next question says, and it's the last question on the page, it says, calculate the period of this wave if the velocity is 9 meters per second. Okay, so if you look on your formula sheet, you'll go V is equal to lambda F, that's the wave equation. We also know that F is equal to 1 over period, and period is equal to 1 over F. And they want the period. So do you agree I could take my frequency and I could substitute for 1 over period? So I could say V is equal to lambda times 1 over period. Okay, do you agree? Lambda velocity is lambda times frequency, right? Frequency is 1 over period. So therefore V is equal to lambda over period. We want the period. So we're going to go V times period is equal to lambda. And then we're going to divide both sides by V, so we get the period is equal to lambda over the velocity. The wavelength is 0, 0,23 over the velocity of 9. And we need to get our calculators out. And we need to move it over. And then we go, okay. So we go 0, 0.233 divided by 9 equals press the SD button. 0.025555, okay, whatever. So, but remember that we're rounding off to two decimal places because this is science. So we round off to two decimal places, which means we look at the third decimal. And the third decimal is a five, which means we're going to round this up. So that becomes 0, 0, 3. okay. So that's 0, 0, 3. and what is that? Grade tens, 0, 0, 3. what? 0, 0, 3 seconds, not six. Not seconds, sec S, just for S for seconds, okay? Like I said to you before, if you're not sure what the unit is, if you don't know if it's S or this X, six, okay, no, that's not right, then rather write seconds. Okay, right, let's move on. So let's talk about echoes, okay? There are a whole bunch of ways that we can use echoes in science and they actually and yeah let me talk about it okay so this sonar and what happens is and this is very cool okay and it works as well with radar 
Okay, radar and sonar. And um, the only difference is this is into the ocean, into the water. Okay, and this is into the air. The radar is into the air. And you guys, if you've ever seen a movie, you've seen something similar to this, okay? Whether it be a movie about airplanes where they have this tracking thing and then you'll see a little um, airplane when in this case they're seeing a little boat. Okay, watch. Here we go. It's going to, any minute, there he goes. It sees the boat. Okay, what is happening, and this is very cool, is that this boat is singing out a ping. Okay, if you've ever seen a movie about submarines and boats, you've seen that they'll talk about the pinging. Okay, and it sends out a sound, a signal, sound signal towards the sub, the submarine, sub, oh my word, submarine. Then what happens is, the submarine obviously reflects the sound, okay, back up to it. And that reflection is called an echo. That's what echoes are. They are just the reflection of a sound wave. And sound waves, by the way, are definitely longitudinal waves. In fact, they're the only longitudinal waves that we talk about. Okay, so as you can see, obviously there's sometimes that this thing will hit part of it, and there's sometimes, if you watch the beginning of the GIF, okay, you'll see that it hits all of it, okay, and then it'll bright up, but then there's sometimes when it'll actually not hit it at all or hit only a little bit of it, okay, and that's when we don't see the submarine at all, okay, what we're seeing, that background noise at the back there, that is the ocean floor, okay. So the other thing is echolocation. Now animals use echolocation. So this is also how um, the radar works, okay? Basically, in exactly the same way. Basically, bats will send out a signal, okay? And then they will get a reflection of that sound. And by determining the difference in the frequency and how long it took for that echo to come back to them, they can actually work out where their prey is or where the walls of the cave are, etc. And dolphins actually use sonar as well to help them find out where their prey are, where other fish are, etc. etc. So those are two typical examples of how we can use echoes. So like I said, echo is just a reflection of a sound wave or a longitudinal wave. So we're going to talk about how we could work use echoes and what we know about echoes to solve some problems, okay? So yeah, we've got Tabo and Tabiso are very much interested in science. They once written in the book that the velocity of sound in air can be determined by echo method, okay? In order to determine the velocity of sound in air, they perform an experiment. Tabo and Tabiso stood 500 meters away from the mountain and Tabo fired a toy gun. Okay, Tabiso simultaneously started a stopwatch. Okay, there's his stopwatch. Their aim was to listen to the echo produced. They repeated the experiment three times and recorded the readings. So actually, they're doing a good job, okay? First of all, they are doing this experiment and they've set up a specific distance from the mountain. Secondly, the same person is shooting the toy gun every time and the same person is recording the time every time. Those are very good things to do in experiments. And then lastly, they've done it at least three times. So they've actually done a very good experiment at this point in time. It says, that first of all, it says determine the average time of the, from the above table of readings and calculate the velocity of sound. Okay, so how do we get average? Do you agree that the average, what do you always do? You add them up and divide by however many readings. So in this case, they're three readings. So it's going to be 3,01 plus 2,95 plus 3,04 all over 3. And I want to point something out to your grade 10s. Um, in the latest CAPS curriculum, especially if you're in the IAB system, especially, you'll notice that this table here says 3.01, 2.95, 3.04, and I'm writing commas. And that's because the IAB system specifically, um, but everybody in the whole CAPS curriculum says that we have to use commas for the decimal point place, okay, for the decimal point. So 3.01, 
point zero one doesn't work for the science curriculum anymore you need to be writing three comma zero one okay so let's go back to this and use a calculator so let's get out our calculator and we're going to go three point zero one or comma one plus to, we don't care what you call it as long as you draw it as a comma. Okay, so you can still say 2.95, but you must draw it as 2 comma 95. So 2.95 plus 3.04 equals, that's wrong. Let's try again. I said 3.4. So 3.01 plus 2.95 plus 3.04 equals, and then we're going to divide by 3, and it's 3. So the average time it took is three seconds okay now it says calculate the velocity of sound now we know that speed of velocity speed equals distance over time but what's special about this time taken this is the time that it took for them to hear it okay their aim was to listen to the echo produced Okay, so what do we need to know? We need to realize that when this toy gun was shot, the sound went to the mountain, hit the mountain, and then got reflected to their ears, okay? So the time it took was actually to get from here to here. The time it took to get from here to here degrees half that time, okay? So the time to the mountain, okay? is going to be 1,5 seconds. Okay, the time it took for the sound to get from Tabo's gun to the mountain is 1,5 seconds. Well, how do we know that? Because it took 1.5 seconds to get, I mean, three seconds to get from Tabo's gun to the mountain and through to Tabiso's ears or their ears. So therefore the speed is going to be the distance, which is 500, over 1,5, and we need to get our calculators out. We're going to do that. Um, so we go 500 divided by 1.5, and we get 333.33 meters. 333,33 meters per second. Grade 12, the other, I mean, the grade 10, the other way of doing it is to realize that this three seconds was for double the distance, and you could have worked exactly the same thing out by going a thousand divided by the three seconds to get three comma, I mean, 333,33 meters per second. And just for the record, if you're on Earth, and you happen to be somewhere near the, um, the, if you're on Earth and you happen to be in air, then your speed of sound is generally between 330 and 340. And the reason changes is because it actually depends on the density of air and how um, humid the air is and how high you are, etc., etc. But if you're not getting an answer between 330 and 340, maybe 350, and you're on the earth in the air, then I would say you're going to think about whether or not you're doing something wrong. Okay, now it says the loudness of sound produced by vivisers depends on two things. What does it depend on? Well, first of all, it's going to depend on the shape of the vivisella. Okay. Because obviously you know that this vivisella is shaped, or you might not, shaped like that. And the reason for that is because it causes the sound to be expanded out, the wave, the waves to be expanded out. Okay, so it makes it louder. And secondly, how hard you blow. And if you've ever tried to make a vuvuzela work, you will know that it's actually quite hard to blow those things to make them work. So therefore, it does depend on how hard you blow the air through the opening of the vuvuzela. Right, let's look at another example. A ship sends a signal to the bottom of the ocean to determine the depth of the ocean. Okay, so here's our ship. Okay, and it's on the ocean, and here's the bottom of the ocean. Okay, let's just do that, okay? It says it sends a signal down to the bottom of the ocean, okay? The speed of sound in water is 1,450 meters per second. See what I told you about? So the speed of sound, the speed, 
of the sound in seawater is 1450 meters per second. Okay, if the signal is received 1.5 seconds later, how deep is the ocean at that point? So the signal travels here and travels back and it takes 1,5 seconds. Okay, so the time for both, for the return, is 1,5 seconds. Now we know that speed equals distance over time. So do you agree that distance is equal to speed times time? Okay, distance equals speed times time. So now what we could do is we either could take this 1,450 multiplied by the 1.5 and then we'd have double the distance and then we'd have to divide by two. Or we could realize that we need to divide this time by two to get a single time, T for a single trip, which is going to be 0, 0,75 seconds. So then it would be 145 uh, multiplied by 0, 0,75 which is what? Let's find out. 1450 multiplied by 0 0.75. Mm -mm. 75 equals 1087,50 meters. 1087,50 meters. Okay. So, oops. <laughs> There were steps. Okay, don't worry about that too much. Um, now it says, okay, that's exactly the same. Okay, we've done that. Now it says, this is a better question. I like this question. A man stands between two cliffs, okay, as shown in the diagram, and he claps his hands once. Assuming the velocity of sound is 330 meters per second, what will be the time interval between the two loudest echoes? Okay, so two now just echoes are always going to be the first ones you hear. So basically, if you do this, then it'll go, it'll go, clap, 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 clap. Okay, right, a, a couple of times. But the loudest echo will be the one just afterwards. So they're talking about the first echo, okay? So they want the interval between the two. In other words, they're saying that this dude is going to clap, okay, he's going to hear an echo coming back from this cliff and he's going to hear an echo hang on coming back from this cliff and they want to know what is the time interval so let us work this out okay so let's do this one first okay the time taken okay do we agree that okay we know that velocity equals distance or speed equals distance over time right we know that this distance is not just 165 meters because that's just one way. The distance is actually, this distance here is going to be 165 multiplied by two because the sound has to get all the way to the cliff and then reflect it and come all the way back to his ears, okay? So the distance is gonna be two fives are 10, five twos are 12 carry one, that's three, 30. Okay, so the distance is 330 meters. Okay, which means what? That means the velocity, like I said, is distance over time. Therefore, we can say the time equals the distance over the velocity, which is going to be 330 over 330 which equals one second. So the time it takes for this guy to hear the echo on this side, on the red ear, okay, is one second. Now let's do it on this side. Now this time the distance is going to be what? It's 110, let's try again, 110 times by two, which is 220 meters. Okay, happy with that? The velocity, again, is distance over time. So the time is going to be distance over velocity, which is going to be 220 over 
330. Okay, so if we get our calculators for that, we get 220 divided by 330 equals two thirds. Okay, so that time is two thirds, which is 0, 0,67 seconds. So what was the question? The question was, what will be the time interval between the two lightest echoes? The time it takes for the red sound to get to the guy's red ear again is one second. The time it takes for this echo to get back to the green ear is 0, 0,67 seconds. So do you agree that 0, the actual difference between the two, the time interval, the time interval, is going to be 1 minus 0, 0,67, which is 0, 0,33 seconds. So that is the difference that you'll hear between the two years. Okay. Right. Whoopsie. That's not true. I didn't stop there, did I? Okay. So what I want to do now is I want to talk to you more about sound and that, and I think I made a mistake, I opened up the wrong PowerPoint. Just can you hold for a second? Um, keep. <laughs> Sorry, very confusing. Uh, Hmm. No, that is the one. That's weird. Okay, I'm terribly sorry that I had more stuff prepared for you guys and it seems to have gone missing. Okay, so in that case, I'm just going to teach you. <laughs> so let me just make a thing and then go from current slide. Okay, so now if we talk about longitudinal waves versus transverse waves, you guys need to be able to list the differences and the similarities between transverse and longitudinal waves. Okay, you need to be able to list the differences and similarity. And the main difference or the only difference really is that the transverse wave is that the particles move, the particles move perpendicular to the direction of the wave. Okay, whereas the longitudinal waves, as you saw, the particles move in the same direction. Okay, the same direction. Otherwise, what is the similarities? The similarities are obvious, okay? The similarities are they both have, they both have, there's another big difference, and I'll talk about that in a second. The sim similarities are they both have um, constructive interference. Oh, let me just, I don't like these lines between them now. Okay, right. Um, I'm sorry, I had a beautiful table for you. This is very frustrating. Okay, I don't know what happened to it. <clears throat> I must have saved it somewhere weird. Okay, they both will undergo constructive interference. Which means that their amplitudes will get bigger. They will both undergo destructive interference. Their definitions for wavelength are the same. Their definitions for period are the same and frequency are the same. Okay. But there is one huge, huge difference. One huge difference. And this is what it is. Okay. The transverse wave does not require a medium. It does not require a medium. In other words, if you think about this, light travels from the sun, okay, light travels from the sun, and it is a transverse wave. So it travels through the sun, which is traveling through basically space, and space is a vacuum, okay, which means that there's no medium there. 
Also, you can think of all your electromagnetic radiation. So, for example, your your microwaves that are coming from your cell phones and go through the cell phone towers and that type of thing, all travel through air, okay? But they don't get distorted. Well, they don't, they still travel even if there's a vacuum. Right, whereas longitudinal waves have to have a medium. Have to have a medium. Okay, in other words, if you've ever seen any of those space shows, I don't know if you've ever seen any Star Wars or anything like that, but if you see a space show and something blows up, okay, and it blows up. So like if you're thinking, if you're thinking Star Wars and you see the Death Star and it blows up, okay, when it blows up in the movies, they go bang, okay, and they make a lot of noise. That is not true. What actually happens is there's so little, there's so few particles in space that it effectively is a vacuum. So therefore there is no sound in space whatsoever. Okay, so in real life you would just see this huge thing explode and it would be absolutely silent. Nothing. You wouldn't hear a thing. Okay. So you need to have a medium. So on that note, wait, let me just clear all this. Um, on that note, if you saw earlier, we mentioned that the speed of sound in air was 330 meters per second. And in the example, you saw the speed of sound in water was approximately 1450 meters per second okay so that might seem counterintuitive to you because you might think well why would a speed of a wave be slower in air than in water but the reason for that is because the water molecules are obviously a medium okay and what it is is the water molecules are closer together okay so what happens is as the particles can actually then compress and rarefy and then compress and then rarefy if they are actual particles. If they aren't particles, then the same particle, the wave front is going to move so much further until it hits a particle and then moves so much further before it hits another particle. So it can't actually travel very fast, okay? Whereas in water, the particles are much closer together. Particles are much closer together. So what does that mean? That means that sound actually travels faster in more dense medium. The denser the medium, the more dense it is, the faster the sound. Okay, the faster the sound. So, I don't know if you've ever seen these old movies. <laughs> I had a picture. In the old movies, um, they used to take, um, if they wanted to find out if something was coming or if they wanted to hear, hear for long distance, what they used to do is they either used to put their ears on railway tracks. Okay, why? Because they were metal. Um, or they used to put their ears on the ground. Okay, so when they put their ears on the ground, okay, there's the Stetson. Okay, it's a terrible drawing. And there's a guy and he's leaning over. Oh my word. Okay. <laughs> okay, I'll get a picture. They lean over and they listen to the sound traveling through the ground, okay? And because the air travels, I mean, sound travels through the ground, it will actually be faster. They'll be able to hear sooner than if they just stood up. Okay, they'll stand up hear much faster if there's actually so, uh, something coming. So another thing that you can actually do for yourselves if you really want to, if for example you've got a long steel beam at school or somewhere or even a piece of wood, you can actually realize that someone could, if, you, if it's really long especially, you get someone to tap it on the one side and you put your hand on it while they're tapping and you'll actually feel the vibration in your hands before you hear the sound. Admittedly, the difference is minuscule if you're talking a very short distance, okay? But 
what we will do in the next lesson, I will find my PowerPoint. It's driving me insane. This is terrible. And I will show you how this breaking the sound barrier works. Okay, and the fact that we can and the fact that we can actually hear things happen or see things happen before we actually hear things happen is because of the speed of sound in air. Okay, grade tens, that's it for today. I hope you've learned a little bit more about sound. Please join me on What's today? Today is Thursday. On Tuesday, and we'll carry on with waves and we'll do some more exam paper questions, etc. Have a great day.